Okay, let's see. Let's get back to my menu here. Okay, good morning, everyone. Today is June 9th, 2018, and this is the John Chappell Natural Philosophy Society Science Chat. It's been a little while since we had our last chat. And uh, please join us uh, at our website, naturalphilosophy.org, uh, where you can uh, join our organization and you can participate in our forums or check us out on Facebook. And our conference is coming right up just a few short weeks from now on June 27th to the 30th at the uh, University of Connecticut. So uh, me and Bill are preparing preparing uh, for the conference. And I, it's, so here's the, uh, here's our poster for the conference here at the University of Connecticut in Stores, USA. And uh, I'll be staying in the uh, economy dorms, so. If anyone else needs a place to stay, you can let me know because there's three rooms in each one of these dorm rooms. All right, so for today, uh, we have Bill Lucas, and uh, he has volunteered to uh, do a presentation for us. So I'm going to let Bill take it away. Something about the truth in science. So go ahead, Bill. What do you got for us? Uh, can you see me? I, I've lost my. Oh, here we go. Maybe this is it. There we go. Great. Um, this presentation I'm giving is uh, one that was designed for a different group. It was designed for the Vitality Institute, which has to do with life. Uh, in, uh, in an international meeting in Las Vegas uh, in this country. And also, it was going to be scheduled for Tel Aviv, Israel. Um, but it got canceled at the last moment. But I've got the presentations, and so I thought I'd use one that might be appropriate for this group. And the first presentation I was going to do for them was one entitled Truth in Science. And so, we're going to look at that question and uh, see from various points of view uh, how to use logic to analyze the existence of truth in our theories of modern science. So one uh, way to uh, that, that truth is supposed to be warranted or guaranteed in science is through the scientific method. And so I'm going to go through some charts that show the scientific method as it changed over time. And the first scientific method comes from the ancient Greeks. And it's called the axiomatic scientific method. Uh, if you took geometry in high school, <laughs> you used the axiomatic method to develop geometry and the theorems in geometry. So we probably are all somewhat familiar with it, but we may not have looked at it in terms of the overall picture. And so, so I want to look at this one first. So basically what the uh, ancient Greeks did is they observed patterns in, say, geometry, and they used inductive logic to come up with certain axioms, or you might call them hypotheses or uh, assumptions that uh, they were going to use in, in that field of natural philosophy. And geometry is one of the fields of natural philosophy. So they used uh, inductive logic. They also used intuition, which is this middle one here. And so using these two techniques, they were able to come up with a series of axioms. Now, axioms are not theories. They're kind of like assumptions. And then using deductive logic, 
And earlier they used inductive logic. Using deductive logic, they were able to uh, come up with a theorem for a theory. And so the theorems of geometry were developed in that way. And so if any of the axioms were disproven by some method, that would falsify the theory and they'd have to do it over. And maybe they just have to make a modification, but something along that line. This went up until basically the time of Isaac Newton. And Isaac Newton began what uh, we call the empirical scientific method. Other people worked on it, but he was the principal uh, proponent of it. And his book, Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, cover how to combine the empirical scientific method So you're still there, Bill? Yeah, can you see me? We kind of lost your audio there for a second. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, the schematic uh, method didn't, when we an observation. And so sometimes it was good to, uh, to do an experiment. An experiment in geometry would be use a straight edge and compass and learn certain things from that. But in other areas of natural philosophy, um, you, you needed more information. And the way to get that information was to do experiments. So Isaac uh, Newton came up with uh, uh, an empirical scientific method where you perform experiments and you obtain your axioms, which is your assumptions, from the experiments. So if we were to take an example of that, which didn't exist in his day, but let's take electrodynamics, uh, we have the uh, empirical laws of electrodynamics. There's uh, Gauss's law for uh, the force between uh, charges and also uh, uh, ma magnets. We have uh, Ampere's law and Faraday's law, Lorenz's law and Lenz's law. So we've got six laws in electrodynamics and uh, Isaac Newton suggested that they be considered as axioms. And so then he said, now what you need to do is you need to use deductive logic and obtain a more general law for the field. So that would be to solve the six equations of electrodynamics simultaneously and come up with a more general solution. And Isaac uh, Newton wasn't around at the time that we got these laws, so it had to be done by someone else. And the person who did that was um, Maxwell. And Maxwell did it in terms of quaternions, which is kind of like matrices. And at the time, no one else was really doing much with matrices or quaternions, particularly in natural, uh, you know, in uh, in electrodynamics. And um, so it wasn't real popular. But one of the, after Maxwell died, uh, one of his uh, followers, Oliver Heaviside, redid it in terms of vectors. Vectors were much simpler than matrices. And, uh, but he didn't use all of the equations. He only used four of them. And then he found various ways to eliminate the extra terms that were in the empirical laws so that he could get a solution. And we would of the the empirical scientific method uh, with the axiomatic. Then,
of the existential scientific method. And the existential scientific method is not based on axioms. It's based on hypotheses, which are like theories. And uh, so it's not based in logic. And uh, so here what you have is uh, you, you make observations or you perform experiments, you define a problem you want to look at, you formulate a hypothesis. And uh, then the hypothesis makes predictions and you perform experiments to see if the predictions are valid or not. And if they are, uh, you uh, uh, basically you confirm or develop a theory based on that hypothesis. And uh, but the hypothesis becomes the theory. And uh, so uh, it's uh, it's a little bit different. And when you ask the question. How is a theory or hypothesis falsified? It's not falsified based on the falsification of an axiom. It's falsified because it doesn't predict the proper data that you expect. But when you look at how we apply that today, Take Einstein's general theory of relativity. It doesn't explain the, it's supposed to explain gravitational effects, but it doesn't explain uh, spiral galaxies correctly. The outer, the velocity of the outer arms of spiral galaxies does not agree with its gravity theory. So what did we do? Did we falsify general relativity theory? No. We invented a second theory to supplement it. It's called dark matter and dark energy. Well, now you see <laughs> that even if it fails in this uh, postmodern scientific uh, philosophy of science, we don't throw it away. We just keep, we just keep it. And uh, so uh, that is very different from the past. And the question is, does that work? And uh, so we we investigating that from a logical point of view more in this presentation. Well, what groups are interested in truth? And uh, you've got religious groups like the Jews, the Christians, and the Islamists. You've got philosophical societies, like the Natural Philosophy Alliance and the Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society. And, uh, you've got people who are interested like the Vitality Institute in health. And uh, what what is the cause of disease, and what's the proper way to fix it, or the the simplest way, or the best way? So you've got a lot of different things, different groups that are interested, but they're not in control of the scientific method. Just like we're we're considered alternative uh, scientists, uh, or radical scientists, or something like that in our organization, and that's the way we're characterized by the people who are controlling things. But there are people who think we ought to be more interested in truth, not just in approximations. So uh, science has been developed in terms of forces. And they're uh, currently the politically correct uh, theories say they're strong. There's four, four fundamental forces, the strong force, the electromagnetic force, the weak force, and gravity. And we're going to see from this presentation uh, how many of these can possibly be true. And uh, so that's a, an interesting question. How many of these can actually be true? So there are uh, the approach in the uh, modern uh, uh, politically correct science is we have these fundamental forces and the weak force, for instance, can be attached to the electromagnetic force to do the electroweak force. And then the strong interaction force can be attached or combined with the strong force to give the, a grand unified force. And, uh, and but the problem they're having is um, 
gravity doesn't fit. And that, <clears throat> they don't know how to explain the quantization of gravity. There's a lot of things that don't fit, but they think these others could possibly fit. And uh, so <clears throat> there's one picture where you can see some of the inconsistencies coming about. But then <clears throat> we can look at uh, the data that we're going to look at the data that we use to justify the strong interaction force and the weak interaction force. And uh, <clears throat> these are were first nuclear type forces. The strong interaction force held the protons together in the nucleus, even though the Coulomb force repelled. And then the um, weak interaction force governed the decay of nuclei. And, uh, and then we've also got forces that hold the uh, electrons into an atom. So here I want to show you uh, one of these uh, forces this is the um, atomic ionization energy. And this is for um, the uh, ionization energy for uh, one electron atoms. But they can have many. They can have up to 110 uh, nucleons or protons in the nucleus. So what we see if we do a plot of the data, we see that it's in the shape of a parabola, and uh, and that's due to the fact that the uh, ionization energy is one over r squared. So one over r squared gives rise to a parabola. But this is the measured experimental data for the uh, for one electron atoms. Now, uh, if we look at um, isotopes of odd atomic weight and we measure the mass of them, uh, we get another interesting uh, uh, value. We get, this is for the, uh, all of the atoms, nuclear isotopes, will have a total atomic weight 181. So uh, there's, there's uh, if you can see, you count on this, there's uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 isotopes that we have measured, nuclear isotopes, the different elements, <clears throat> but they all have atomic weight of 181. And when we plot it, we get this parabola again. And the parabola is, if you do a least square fit, is a very good fit. And uh, we, uh, when, we ha when we made our theory of uh, the strong interaction force and the weak interaction force, the question is, how much data do we have and how good was it? Well, we didn't have 13 isotopes of the same atomic mass. We had typically one or two. We didn't have it measured to eight significant figures, but now we do. And so there was a lot of uh, uncertainty as to conservation of energy and all that kind of stuff in terms of nuclear decay and uh, things of that sort. So we didn't know uh, if our theories of strong interaction, weak interaction were completely valid. But now we do. So this shows the least square fit of that data. and. Uh, you can see that it is a very uh, good fit, and uh, uh, but we're measuring data now to uh, eight significant uh, figures. In those days, we were doing three. Okay. Now, if we do the atomic, if we do the mass of even atomic weight, 104, uh, we can have the the data doesn't look very good. It doesn't look uh, like the curve of a parabola goes through all the data. However, there's two cases here. There's a case where you have an even, even, even number of protons and let's say even number of neutrons in the nucleus, or you have an odd, odd, which would be an odd number of protons and odd number of uh, neutrons that add up to 104. So if you take that into account, you can break this up into two curves. 
and one of them is the even even and the other one is the odd odd and now both of them do lie on very good well-defined parabola so uh, what does that mean well it means that all of the known 3,500 nuclear isotopes have a 1 over R squared force going on inside the nucleus and nothing else. Now, what does a strong interaction force look like? Is it 1 over R squared? No. It's 1 over R to the fifth. What is the weak interaction force? Bill, what's R, what, what is R squared? What, what is R? What's R? R? R is the distance between the nucleons. Between the nucleons? Yes, inside the nucleus. Okay, so and R we is... We together by, by a force, and uh, we see that that force, this parabola only is, uh, mathematically, is only valid for one of our squared force. All yeah. right, so one over R squared, I mean, that's uh, the standard uh, uh, force law. I mean, electromagnetics and gravity is one over R squared, right? That's right. All right, thank you. Okay, so now... Well, Bill, I, I still have a question about... Uh, so what about this parabola uh, tells us that it's a one over R squared force? That's the thing that I really don't... Okay. quite understand it has something to do with the energy budget or something like that that uh, if it was one over uh, it's, if a one over r completely experimental it's complete completely experimental what i showed in the first slide you go back here to it this is um the um i think you know i gotta go back a little more time here we go. This is for one electron atoms for the entire sequence of all the elements. And it forms a perfect parabola. Okay. And we know... So what does that mean? I mean, that... Okay. Well, what is the force between the electron and the nucleus? Okay. Um, let, me, let me see if I can straighten this out. What you're saying is that if I take all the electrons away except for one, for a atom with a nuclear charge of 40, I measure this atomic ionization energy. Is that what you're saying? No, this is for all of the elements from zero to 110. I understand that, but I have to take away all the electrons. You take but away one. all of the electrons but one. All right. So if I, have an atom, if I have an atom of iron, I strip it of all the electrons, but the last one, and then I measure the ionization energy for the last one. That's right. And so that's the force between one electron, which is a very simple case, and the nucleus, which is very small compared to the, uh, the electron. And so uh, you see that, uh, uh, and you don't have, there's no strong interaction involved. There's no weak interaction involved there. And there's, uh, there may be a force of gravity, but it's very insignificant compared to the electromagnetic force. And so, so anyway, as a result of that, uh, we, we see that we can say something about the, uh, we know this is a 1 over R squared type force, and we see that the 1 over R squared force is associated with a parabola. And mathematically, that's what you would predict. But with, experimentally, to eight significant figures, we see that. And uh, we had never measured that before the year 2000. So that's kind of new for us in science. Well, is, well can, can I just ask a question? I mean, you know, we, we never do see how this is measured. So isn't a huge amount of assumption built into the process of measuring the force between a single electron and an atomic nucleus? I mean that's charge essentially so you're just measuring the charge reaction and you know what when instruments you know i mean it's a practical matter i don't know whether that's something that can be um it's it, measured you know, in multiple ways, ways. You have to go it's into the experiment doing the measurement the measuring tool is more complicated than your chart yeah it's measured it's measured uh in more precisely than any other kind of quantity we can measure in science 
eight significant figures. Every we just say, okay, okay, okay. We just have to accept it because you say it then. Because I'm just yeah. saying, how, well, what's that. the ruler made out of? What is the ruler made out of? What is the scale made out of? I'm saying it's an incredibly complex thing to say you have a measurement of because all of the assumptions built into it, especially when they claim there's antiparticles and neutrinos and all this other stuff floating around inside of atoms. Yeah, now those are assumptions that can't be proven, but they're assumed. This is just empirical data. And so you have to say- My cow, empirical data is when I go outside and the sun hits me and it's warm and it's undeniable, the sun is hitting me and it's warm. That's empirical data, okay? Uh, the, this analysis through all this complex hardware to be able to measure the strength or pull on an electron, somehow you have to hold the electron to know how much is being pulled. No, 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 no. This is the energy to remove that one the electron from the atom. Right, exactly. It's the energy to remove it, which doesn't. Right. And the reason why we can measure the eight significant figures is we have right. to. Well, all right. I guess you're just going to keep telling me what they measured it to eight significant figures with the ruler that we're never going to have a good description of. The ruler is what? The an ruler accelerator? is the, the electromagnetic energy we have to give to that electron. How do you give it? The point is, is these are accelerator experiments. No, these are not accelerated experiments. These okay. are atomic. Then, then how, how are they done? That's my okay. question. If you go online to NIST, they tell you all the experiments for every one of these dots. And it's not just one experiment. Each of those dots has been well, those are just by different all elements. I get the part that those are just different elements. Okay? Right. Each dot is a different I, element. I, I, okay, they do the same experiment on a bunch of different elements. And you're saying they're measuring how much how strong the relationship is between the electron and the proton based on how much energy they say it takes to remove the electron from the protons. Right. Now, that energy we can measure in multiple ways. For instance, let's say I've completely removed all the electrons from this atom, and now I bring a free electron up and it gets captured. What happens when it gets captured? Does anything come out of the atom? Well, see, that's the whole, that's the argument I would make is that it's more subtle than that because when, say, two atoms combine, they don't necessarily capture anything. They just share. We're not something. talking about two atoms combining. I know we're not, but we're still talking about what it takes to extract something from another thing. I can extract the earth from the sun by bringing another sun in proximity to the earth and pulling it away from the sun it's held by. Right. Now we have a theory about how much atom. energy was in the thing that pulled the electron away. There's different. We have ways. a theory of the atom that says as the electron is captured, it gives off light as it makes its transition from one shell to the next shell to the next shell until finally it. All right. Well, I'm not gonna. I won't push this as detail and minutia. I won't push it. I just make the general argument that. You know, when you're having a discussion about how one weighs evidence and how one establishes what is proven fact, and then you talk about what they say, you know, that's sort of like, you know, isn't that just saying, well, it's a proven fact because the Pope says so. It's not a proven fact because you can know so. It's a proven fact because somebody told you so. No, this is what is measured. And well, again, measured with what? Okay. So you could say, using your oh, argument, okay, okay, okay. Circles. there's I'll no such thing up. as the atom, it's just your imagination when you see an electron being captured by an atom and this stuff coming out, you don't know what that represents. You don't know that there's energy levels in the atom, you don't know, you know, you, you see what I'm saying, you're, you're questioning everything. Now we're going to question everything a little bit later uh, when we look at logic in this, but what I'm trying to point out is that, let's say we wanted to discover gravity. Can gravity be measured to eight significant figures? Yes. Do you get consistent results? No. You can measure gravity at one point on the surface of the Earth today and measure it tomorrow, and guess what? It doesn't even agree to five significant figures, much less eight. But you can measure it to eight. What is going on? You don't know. It's well, again, see, you're, you're just saying stuff. We do know the Earth is always changing in terms of its mass structure. So obviously, to eight significant figures, the Earth is gigantic, and any change 
a, a, a nanometer, a few hundred nanometers of change in density could probably give you a 10 figure uh, change in, in gravity. So I'm just saying that that's sort of understandable. Well, we also understand that gravity is decaying because experimentally it's been decaying for hundreds of years. All right. Well, that is a, that's your another assertion. Well, that that I think it's been oh, okay. Okay. You say it decays. It, yeah, where, where, where has that been established by any of conventional physics? It's, I will, I don't, I won't be able to show that here, but the expansion of the earth, the three dimensional expansion of the earth is extremely well documented. But no, I'm, I'm sorry, it is not, but okay. Okay. I guess this is just going to be a sermon. Okay. Got it. <laughs> The GPS data shows that the Earth is expanding. The U.S. Navy sonar data shows the expansion marks for the oceans, in the bottom of the oceans of the Earth, and that shows the three-dimensional expansion mark, and it's not uh, uh, these uh, plates moving back and forth. It's three-dimensional expansion. Right. And the death of all the large animals that we have found, like the dinosaurs, is due to the fact that yeah, what did they breathe then what did they breathe because with less well, let, let's not make this into there's less uh, dense and there's less oxygen in it so if you're going to propose a theory you have to answer all the questions it 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 creates they're all the paradoxes and all of the conflicting evidence and there's a well, ton i of think we're we're getting that, too far we are getting too far off the topic here and i don't want to have bill's presentation uh go off in to a discussion it, about it. I think it is the topic because we're talking about truth and science, and we have a person here who says there's no such thing as bad, I think. I mean, the point is well taken, but if I let this conversation go on, then people will be arguing about the expansion of the earth and uh, <laughs> that. Well, which that's can't, certainly which not part do, of this but, discussion. Okay, well, let's go on and look at some more uh, data that's coming out of NIST. Now, NIST pays laboratories throughout the world to make these measurements. They get grants. So it's not NIST interpretation. It's the agreement. They have to get multiple laboratories to measure the same thing that is in an agreement. And uh, so here, we're going to look at the, the question that neutrons and the weak force we, we, the previous argument we showed indicated there didn't seem to be any evidence for the weak force, which is one of our cube force, uh, in the nucleus, uh, nuclear isotopes, when you measure them to eight significant figures. Here we're going to look at a different type of argument. Here we're going to look at uh, tritium decaying to helium. And uh, this is shown on the uh, screen. And if neutrons exist in the nucleus, the binding energy of a neutron, which is 0.782 MeV, should be released. But experimentally, the, set, the uh, escaping electron has only this amount, so 0.01859 MeV of kinetic energy. And there are no known nuclear isotopes in which the binding energy of the neutron can be discovered from decay. And that was, in the past, we didn't measure it to precisely enough to know that, but now we can measure it to eight significant figures, and you can see that we don't get it. We don't get uh, the data for the existence of neutrons in the nucleus. So, and this is on the NIST site, which is considered one of the best sites in the world for giving you all the measurements that have been made to the highest precision. And it wasn't just in the United States. They, they gave laboratories around the world who had the best expertise to do this measurement. So how do they come up with a binding energy for a neutron? What, what does that mean? Okay, this is the basically the mass of the tritium, hydrogen, and then this is the mass of the helium, okay? And then you take the difference of the two, because one decays to the other, and this is the difference in the terms of energy, but 
and this is written out in MeV, and you can see that it's not the binding energy of the neutron. If the neutron comes apart to a proton and an electron, which is what happens in this uh, decay process, uh, this, uh, this should be 0.782 MeV, but it's not. Well, my question is, where do they come up with the 0.782? I mean, how do they determine what the binding energy is? Accelerators. Neutrons are elementary particles. We make them. We can measure it. We can measure the binding energy of a neutron in accelerator experiments, which we have done. But this is a nuclear experiment where we take tritium and let it decay to helium. And uh, we don't see the binding energy of 0.0782 MeV. So that means, and this is not just one case, every known case in the entire table of elements. There's 3,500 nuclear isotopes, many of which decay like this, uh, and they do not show any evidence for the neutron being decaying inside of the nucleus. So, but we didn't have that data 20 years ago. We just have gotten it in the last 20 years. And the people who are controlling the uh, scientific method are trying to come up with some other explanation to keep neutrons in the nucleus, but they have not been too successful yet. And so I'm just wanting to let you know that the data is out there. It's the most precise data we have ever measured, and it is not helping us with our current theories. It's falsifying them. So let's see if we have another one here. Here's a whole bunch more. <laughs> uh, and uh, so we see all of these things are supposed to be producing it, and this is the value that you see, and it's not the correct value. And so, uh, uh, so uh, this agrees with the plot of the nuclear isotope masses that we had, which showed that there was only one over R squared force in all 3,500 nuclear isotopes. And this is showing, uh, and it was one over R squared, so it couldn't be a weak force or a strong force in there because they would have a different shape. They wouldn't be a parabola. And uh, so, uh, and this is uh, more data of that sort that for specific cases that we can measure very well. So, what are the conclusions if we assume conservation of energy? And we, and, and, we find that there's no strong interaction in the nucleus, there are no neutrons in the nucleus, only protons and electrons, and there's no weak interaction in the nucleus. Now, you're going to say, well, I don't agree with the interpretation of that data. But now we're going to look at what logic tells us. Logic tells us more. But before we do that, uh, this is how we have developed modern science in terms of models of matter. We have a theory of elementary particles, we have nuclei, we have atoms, we have molecules, we have crystals, we have a solar system, we have galaxies, we have the universe. Now, the question is, are any of these theories true? And uh, these are the theories behind a lot of this are electrodynamics, quantum mechanics, special relativity theory, general relativity theory, gravity, inertia, and Mach's principle. So the employment of logic in modern scientific method was originally um, worked on more than by, by this fellow here, uh, Henri Poincaré more than any other uh, natural philosopher that I know of. And he created a, a branch of mathematics called meta theory. And it was to provide theorems and logical rules that all theories and all areas of natural philosophy must adhere to if the quest for truth is to be successful using logic. And so we're going to look at that. And we're going to see, is that consistent with what we saw earlier? Okay, in uh, 
science today, we tend to try to write our scientific theories in a precise form, in a mathematical form, which we call an equation. And the first theorem by Henri Poincaré, and by the way, he published the derivation and proofs of these theorems. And I went to University of Maryland in College Park because it was the world's largest physics department with over 300 full-time faculty members in the physics department. And it had more students, it had 600 entering graduate students every year and 1,000 undergraduate students majoring in physics every year. No other school in the country, in the world, has that many. So you know, I, uh, I went there <laughs> uh, to uh, uh, learn uh, more about that. But anyway, uh, the first, what I was going to tell you about is the proof of this that Henri Poincaré uh, proved and published in book form. Uh, you are not allowed anywhere in the world to access those books. They're in the University of Maryland Physics Library, Physics and Engineering Library. And I went to school there and I asked to see it because it was in the card catalog and it wasn't on the shelf. So I went to see the head librarian and asked who had it checked out. And she said, no one is allowed to check it out. No one at the university is allowed to see it. I said, why is that? He said, well, under the education framework in the United States, every school that receives federal funds must obey certain rules. And one of the rules is this proof of the arguments from meta theory by Henri Poincaré is not allowed to be seen by anyone. And so you either must destroy it or you must lock it up in a safe and keep it there. And no one at the university is allowed to see. And that's what she told me. And she was a friend of mine. I knew her from having done a lot of work in the library for my uh, master's degree there. And so uh, uh, I think what she was saying was true. And so I called my friend in Brazil, uh, Asi, and uh, asked him if he could get access to it. And he said, no, the Brazilian government does not allow it. They destroyed all those books. And then he was went on a, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, leave of absence for, you get one every uh, year, every few years, uh, to France, where Poincaré was. And he says, uh, I think I can find it in the library here in France. And he went, and he says, oh, I can't access it, even even going to where Poincaré did his work. I, there is not available. And, and why is that? Why is the proof of these theorems not available? Because it falsifies every major theory of modern science, and they don't want that to be known. But I know what the theorem is, I just don't have the proof. So I want you to see this, I want you to understand what is going on in the background. And uh, I couldn't believe it when I first heard it. I thought we were more open in science. I thought we would... I still don't believe it. Uh, you know, it's yeah. a nice you story. Bit, right. you, you, think, you think every library in the world has a special edict to cover up Henry Poincaré. So, I, you know, you can be as racist as you want. You can have Nazi literature. I can read Hitler's book, but I can't read this guy's theory. That's your theory? I think it's no, I no, think no, wait it's a truth wait or theory. Wait a minute. I got, there's a website that has the name of every library in the United States that has some of these books. I contacted all of them. I got the same response from everyone. Prove it. I mean, everyone, you got the same response. They told you they covered the up the book. They're hiding it. the book. They're hiding it. They told you they're hiding it. That's what they told you, or they said we don't have it. They said we're hide. We're, we've got it locked up, and we're not allowed to let anyone see it. All right. That, that can't be the truth. I'm sorry. Does anybody else clear. believe that's the I truth? Just as shocked Does as anybody you. believe that's the truth? That librarians yes. traditionally do that? They cover up 
Well, please, please let know. Bill, please let Bill finish his thing. This is okay. incredibly exciting. I don't want to listen to you too. Who could be excited? Frankly, you don't. Propaganda. Okay, let's look at okay, it. Let's I mean, your your point your point is taken that you know people are uh, allowed to uh, doubt claims, and so you know it, I think it's it's it is a quite remarkable claim that a li librarian would say you're not allowed to see that book. Uh, but we'll have to just take Bill's word on that. That is his. That's what he claims. When you see. And, uh, <laughs> Um, now, my myself, sure. I'm just looking like at Amazon.com. See whether I can find any books by Henri Ponocare. Oh, you can find books by him, but not the ones with the proofs of meta theory. Well, what do you know? What the name of the book is? There's multiple books. Yes. I well, just just give I me don't have one it right here in front of me, but uh, I can send it to you by email if you want. Uh, hey, for um, anyone who Excuse me. If anyone who doesn't want to listen to Bill's presentation, please leave. Uh, this is incredibly exciting to me. Please let him finish his presentation. Okay. Let's let's go here to some of these theorems. Now. The first theorem is that no two fundamental theories in nature can employ the same fundamental constants, such as c, the velocity of light. Well. Here is electrodynamics. You can see we, in order to get an equal sign in here, we've got to have C. Well, here's special relativity theory, and it uses C. But what, what uh, Poincaré pointed out was no two fundamental theories, in order to have a, an equation with an equal sign in it, they must have a unique fundamental constant, not the same as another theory. And so we find special relativity has that. Quantum mechanics has C. General relativity theory has C. And then the second theorem is only fundamental theories can be true theories. So that means every fundamental theory, every true theory must have different constants than the other theory. Okay, do you understand that idea? All right, now let's go on and do some more arguments. No two fundamental force laws can have the same mathematical form, such as one over r squared. But we've got the force of gravity and the electromagnetic force, both being one over r squared. Okay, let's go and see some more. According to the superposition principle, a set of theories describing the universe cannot be logically consistent and physically stable unless it consists of only linear theories or one nonlinear theory. So let's look at our force laws. Electromagnetic force law is nonlinear in one over r squared. The gravitational force laws, nonlinear in one over r squared. Quantum mechanics is linear. Relativity theory is nonlinear in V or V squared over C squared. So, what do we have? Let me see, let's see if we have any more. No, here's a. Uh, okay. So, uh, before I give you Poincaré's conclusions, which are in his uh, using meta theory, uh, what we see is. Uh, a lot of our theories can't be true. How many can be true? Well, if there's only one theory and it's uh, quantum mechanics based on the Schrodinger equation, it's a linear theory. And it could possibly be true. But it couldn't involve electrodynamics. It couldn't involve uh, these other uh, things because they're not mm -hmm. consistent with one another. And, uh, and so we have this superposition principle, which has a lot of ramifications, and uh, it's not being used. So well, let's look and see what Poincaré conclusion he came to. And by the way, this was in 1905. And if you are familiar with Poincaré, you know he published the first theory of 
relativity in 1904, one year before Einstein. And his, these arguments that we're giving here caused Einstein to never have received any prize for the work on relativity theory as long as Poincaré lived because people felt like his arguments were valid. Okay, here's what he had to say. He said, I think C is the most proper fundamental constant for electrodynamics. That's one conclusion. The other conclusion is all the theories of modern science that have C are false, or electrodynamics is the only fundamental theory. But if electrodynamics is the only fundamental theory, it's got to explain all the data these other theories explain. So he says, if that's the case, electrodynamics is incomplete. And when completed, it should replace the theory of gravity, the theory of quantum mechanics, the theory of relativity theory. That would then make the electrodynamic force the universal force. So based on just the logic of meta theory, he said that either the electrodynamic force is the universal force or all the theories are wrong, we got to start all over. Basically, that's what he said. And uh, now, how do you think uh, the scientific community like that? Why do you think they don't want you to see the proof of his theorems of meta theory? Just because they don't like it. And uh, so, anyway, that that's uh, the conclusion. So, is there much truth in science? Well, the conclusions from meta theory are, is that most of the fundamental forces are not true theories; they're in doubt. Uh, and all the theories appear to be invalid, except for perhaps electrodynamics, which is incomplete. Now, what did what did uh, Oliver Heaviside do? that might cause electrodynamics to be incomplete, he did not use the complete set of the empirical laws of electrodynamics. He used four of them, and there are six. And also, you see that all the models of matter are currently invalid from this type of argument in uh, meta theory. If, if you don't have a uh, just a purely electrodynamic model. But we saw from the NIST data that everything in the, uh, in terms of the nucleus in the atom seems to be explainable in terms of electrodynamics in one of our square force. So, so what uh, we will be presenting at the conference on the last day, uh, how by correcting the work of Oliver Heaviside and developing electrodynamics in terms of the complete set of the empirical laws of electrodynamics, you can explain all of the properties of the nucleus of the atom, and I will show that. Uh, Half of the energy states of the atom cannot be predicted by uh, the, either the Bohr model or the Schrodinger model or the Dirac model. And I'll show that there, uh, those theories miss all of the uh, atomic spectral lines in the extreme ultraviolet. Extreme ultraviolet cannot be measured on Earth, but it can be measured in space, and NASA has measured it, and they've measured hundreds of lines. And they're all predicted by a new theory of the atom, which uh, I helped one of my sons do when he was in, in high school, and he won the grand prize at the International Science Fair, which was worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, and uh, but so anyway, that uh, I'll also show that the theory of gravity can be explained entirely in terms of electrodynamics, and you don't need uh, uh, dark matter and dark energy to rescue it, like you do for general relativity theory. Uh, and uh, so we'll see all of those things coming out. 
and, and I'm in the process of publishing new uh, uh, new theory of elementary particles, new theory of the nucleus, new theory of the atom, uh, new theory of molecules, and the nature of life. And uh, so those are all in process, but the papers that underlie those have been published at international scientific conferences around the world. And uh, in, in the Soviet Union, and uh, for the Soviet Academy of Science in St. Petersburg, uh, in uh, Ukraine, in Germany, in France, in Spain, Great Britain, United States, Canada, all of them have uh, had this material presented. And the reaction of the scientific community is very strong. Like uh, I gave a presentation two years ago in Baltimore, Maryland for the American Institute of Physics, and it was primarily attended by uh, European uh, scientists and uh, two Nobel Prize winners. There were three invited speakers. Two of them were Nobel Prize winners, and the third was myself. And after I made my presentation, there was a uh, great upset, <laughs> and the, uh, uh, they asked that my coming to the conference be uh, eliminated from all records. They asked that my paper not be published in the proceedings. Uh, they asked that my video of my talk be destroyed, and the people who were at the American Institute of Physics had so much pressure applied to them, they had to do that. I don't know if you've ever, had a con ever been to a conference like that. I've been to a number of them that were very strong uh, interaction. But uh, uh, let's see if there's any more. I guess the end of this presentation. So, the, so what you have seen here is uh, we've talked about how the data no longer supports many things that make up the basis, the foundation of modern science, and how logic and the meta theory invalidates uh, all of the theories except possibly electrodynamics in modern theories of science. So, and it's not just physics, I just showed physics, but it also applies to chemistry, it applies to uh, geology, it applies to astronomy, uh, it is just uh, all, all the major theories of modern science. And I'm not going to give the reason, but I think I know the reason <coughs> they were made that way. Okay, at this point we can have questions. We'll get to go first. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you, Bill. So, Bill's opening up to questions, or if you want to just put something in the chat, we can well, monitor that can, as well. Can, can I make well, a, a, a final and somewhat misleading? Yeah, well, can we take turns? Like, can, can you point out who get? I, I just need a couple of minutes and I'll make my points. Okay. If that's okay. Um, First of all, what Pancrier was saying was that you can't have, that there's uh, very unlikely that you're going to have something that's different that's the same. So things that are different aren't going to have the same foundation. They're going to have a different foundation. And so you could see it in his last statements there. He's basically saying that, look, Pancrier didn't know the speed of magnetism. Pancrier didn't know the speed of gravity. And it turns out that those things have an actual speed. It's not just an accident that it's the speed of light. It is the speed of force, you could say. So in a sense, there's a speed of force. And it's not the speed of just light. It's the speed of all these forces. So all these forces have a common speed. And so in a sense, that's an argument for how they're unified, they're connected. Now, you're arguing that everything that science has observed is somehow wrong because they have flaws in their um model and I, I all of us i think would agree that there's an it, there, there's a paradoxical conflict between bent space and quantum mechanics the two theories are too different they're too alien to each other to ever coexist the truth has to be something different um, one of them's right one of them's wrong kind of thing so we already know they're missing something and you know so by Pancre's logic we don't have to say the force is electric. We don't have to say the force is magnetic. We don't have to say the force is gravitational. We don't have to, we don't have to pick which one is the first force, but we could argue they're all the same force, just different manifestations. So light would be the force at a frequency, the electromagnetic spectrum. It's the force at a frequency. Gravity is the force without a frequency and magnetism is the force polarized, something like that. 
and it answers all the questions of why they have the same speed. But to say, you know, to turn Poincaré's words and imply that he was saying that it's not possible that these could be the same force when he didn't know the speed of these other forces is putting words in his mouth that I think is a little unfair. Well, I think his uh, arguments are kind of independent of, of uh, uh, some, some kind of concept like that, but uh, he was saying that um, the, the po there was a possibility that electrodynamics could be the universal force, in which case all of this, these uh, results were just... Uh, uh, results that should be coming out of electrodynamics. Well, well, if we found the force of gravity speed first, and we called it the force, of the speed of gravity. So if C was called the speed of gravity, or it was called the speed of magnetism, then would you be um, arguing that the foundational thing should be magnoomics or dynamics, magnodynamics or gravidynamics? I'm just saying that you're saying that it's all electrodynamics. I'm saying, no, the, the fundamental force is one of these things that moves the speed of light. Okay, one of them you might argue is the most fundamental or the most rudimentary. But, you know, you're just arbitrarily picking electrodynamics because it's associated with light and they associated light with electricity. So that's all. That's the reason why you're choosing it is because we decided what C was based on the speed of light, we discovered that speed first. But all the other speeds are real detected speeds. And they are, in fact, the same. Well, um, what, what I did is I discovered this uh, a number of years ago. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> I have replaced all those theories that you saw with a theory that is simpler and explains more data. Yeah, I have my own theory too. Uh, your argument, your presentation like is asserting a very extraordinary, making extraordinary claims, and you're not providing extraordinary or even ordinary evidence, in my opinion. And oh, wait frankly, wait. that's really breaking the rules. But wait a minute. If I explain all of the spectral data for an atom from electrodynamics using a finite size soliton called an electron, <laughs> Uh, and I'm able to explain not only the data that the current theory of the atom explains, but I'm able to explain an extreme ultraviolet, which is another 50% of the total uh, spectral lines of the atom. And no current theory of the atom that I know of can explain that. And yeah, so, well, I, I, I'm just saying I have a current theory of the atom that explains all of this stuff. So again, we're the argument is is how do we how do we tell how do we tell stories that NASA how do we tell, how do we, how do we distinguish between how do we distinguish any of the hundreds of lines that NASA has found for the spectrum of hydrogen? I don't think you have. I don't, I, think, I, think, I don't think you've studied as much as I have the stuff I've studied. I've I've studied in detail interferometers and the two slit experiment and other phenomenon that quantum mechanics is based on, and I found better answers to those questions through my own investigation. So I, I'm not going to hit sit there have some competition. Yeah, I'm talking about the theory of the atom. Right, that's what you want to do. I'm just trying to make an argument about the idea when you make claims, you know, we're all we're all obligated to persuade each other with evidence. We can't persuade each other with name dropping or citations to magical experiments that are somehow empirical when they're not. So I'm just saying that we're all under the same obligation to prove a case and, and you know, we're, we're not allowed to basically prove it by saying everybody says I'm right or something like that. We have to prove it through a sequence of logic. And I'm just saying there's sequences in your logic where you're citing punk way saying it's not possible that these things could all have the same speed when that wasn't what he was saying. No, I didn't say that. I said that yeah, that sure constant in, the, in their empirical laws it indicates their empirical law has to be electrodynamic in nature. Well, as I just pointed out, I think that's an arbitrary 
a choice made by the circumstance of what speed we discovered first. So you're just saying the first speed discovered is the first cause and everything has to be molded onto that first foundational cause. And I'm saying, I think I could make the same argument that no, I can make an argument that gra gravity is the more rudimentary expression of the force and make a very good argument in my opinion. And that photons are a more complex and much smaller um, uh, energy quanta uh, expression of that force and a much narrower expression of that force. So I, I don't think it's the fundamental force at all just by that logic alone. So you're saying gravity, your, your preference is that gravity is more the fundamental force? Versus I, I'd rather not say that they're I mean, it's fundamental in the sense that it, it doesn't it isn't segregated by free frequency that is it doesn't it isn't been manipulated so gravity would be the unmanipulated force photons would be manipulated in the sense they have the frequency and magnetism would be manipulated in that it's segregated based on polarization uh, electron force versus proton force positive charge versus negative charge so yes gravity is the most basic form the other forms are real forms they're not less real but they're just uh, more, more complexly modified forms of the same force. This is not a forum for you to expound your theory. Well, I, I didn't know that's what it wasn't a forum for. Sorry. Well, I mean, everyone is free to, uh, to express well, I, their... I disagree with that. We're talking about Bill's paper. I have some comments that I'd like to make about Bill's presentation, so I think we should do that. Yeah, I did that. Frankly, yeah. right. well, you're yeah. done now. Then. Oh, thank you for telling me. Go ahead, Mister. Tell me what I've done or what I haven't done, person. You're an arrogant. You are incredible. Okay, arrogant. just a minute. Just a minute. Let's be respectful let's, here. Okay. I mean, let's just let other people talk. I have questions. Okay. okay go ahead, Harry. Go well, ahead. Your well, turn. I did ask question. the moderator to 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 announce which one of us would be able to respond. I was trying to be respectful of everybody's right to. You could have been chosen as the first person to respond. I'm not trying to overwhelm or dominate anybody here. So yes, I'll please go ahead. But you're saying that you've just interrupted. Hmm. I think the issue here is your question is, how can we falsify a scientific theory? And I'm, I'm kind of confused about this the existential and postmodern scientific method here that you're saying here. Okay, so to me, the question is, how do you falsify a scientific theory? Isn't that really what your question is? Then you present evidence that the modern scientific theories are false when you present your empirical evidence. Isn't that really what you're saying? Well, you're talking, are you asking me that question, Harry? Well, the assumption is that you left out a point here in the postmodern scientific method, okay, which I think is the issue that really has been discussed here, and that is the postmodern scientific method says you have to propose a theory that's better than the theory that we've already developed after 30 or 40 or 50 years of working on it. And so we're not going to listen to you unless you can come up with a better theory than we've had come up with after 50 years of work. The, the uh, let's just take the theory of the atom. Uh, the theory of the atom involves a nucleus and electrons. And the electron we know from experiment has a magnetic moment. It has a second type of magnetic moment, which we call spin. And it's got a mass and uh, it's got a size and it's not a point. Now, if you look at the quantum theories of the atom, uh, they have a lot of problems. They cannot explain why it has a magnetic moment, why it has a spin, which is a second type of magnetic moment. They cannot explain the origin of its mass. They cannot explain uh, why it doesn't spiral into the nucleus because in an accelerator if you have electrons going around the accelerator and you have a 
uh, positive charge in the center, uh, the electron will always spiral into it as soon as you stop giving it energy to keep it from spiraling in. And so the experimental data is all against the theory of the current theories of the atom that we have. But what do we do? How is it that we justify the theories? Because the, the what they're predicting doesn't agree with what we observe experimentally. The assumptions they have don't agree with what we observe experimentally. None of that data is used to falsify the theory. Why, why is that? The bottom line is, Bill, as you're saying, that basically you can't falsify a theory in existential and postmodern scientific method. It's impossible to say the theory is wrong because they will always say we can fix it somehow. Unless, unless for some political reason they want that to happen, then they, they accept it. Yes. So and, it seems to me there's a flaw in the scientific method right there, which is how do you establish that there's something wrong in what the modern scientific method says is so? How can you establish there's a mistake in there? And it doesn't look like in your diagram that there's any way to do it. Yeah, and this is not my diagram. This is from <laughs> the literature in textbooks and that sort of thing as to how the, the postmodern and existential scientific method works. Uh, and uh, so, um, so there's no change. falsification of any modern scientific method. It's just not possible. It's not well, it, it, would, it would seem to me that they're just ignoring this. I mean, I think this diagram is perfectly good, but if you're sitting there and you're doing the analysis and it says experimental data inconsistent with hypothesis, which is actually what Bill is saying, you know, they're supposed to just, revision just the hypothesis. theory by changing some, introducing a new hypothesis or changing some parameters. You don't actually what about admit the weak theory is wrong. Evidence. I mean, there's really hard evidence. I mean, the empirical, you know, right in your hands, right in your face evidence. And then there's w evidence that's quite abstract. And I think that's a distinction that has to be made that most of modern physics is based on uh, equations and uh, experiments that have an, an insane number of assumptions built into them. And any one of those assumptions, if incorrect, means the results of the experiment are completely incorrect as what they've interpreted them to be. So I'm just saying, you know, you have to weigh the evidence based on its strength. I would argue that there's absolutely no evidence of gravitational lensing because you can you can falsify the evidence in the sense that you can present an argument that points out how it can't happen without your special dark matter or without some some magical extra that you put into the reality to fix it. So I think that just points out how the evidence is weak. So you just say it's a weak theory versus a strong theory, but there has to be some distinction between the quality of the evidence. Well, that distinction I think is based on uh, whether or not it's done by the government and whether or not, uh, uh, how many people have reviewed the experiment, how many people reviewed the uh, funding request and all of the processes that go into getting the money from the government and getting all the approvals and there's all these reviews and and everything and so the assumption is by the time you come out with a result the result is correct well that's what i'm saying though it's a manufactured theory that doesn't really have any hard evidence behind it so it's just a if you were to go to trial and you were going to convict somebody of of murder and send them to prison for 99 years I don't think you'd want to do it based on the evidence for quantum mechanics or the evidence for bent space. It's really weak evidence, not really strong evidence. In the case of uh, bending of starlight, uh, uh, Ed Dowdy has taken, who used to work for NASA, he's retired now, uh, he has shown that the NASA data doesn't support that. And uh, the bending of starlight as you're going by the sun should be a certain amount depending upon the distance from the center of the sun. And what you find is when you're going through the outer uh, edges of the sun, you do get a bending of starlight. But as you go farther out, it doesn't exist at all. And it should be still a very measurable quantity. 
Mm -hmm. Well, it really shouldn't because Einstein's math took away two factors. It doesn't apply the inverse square law, as you pointed out in your thing. It's a very fundamental law of how forces behave. And uh, it also pretends that because photons are moving the speed of light, that they're somehow in the gravity twice as long because they think they are. Those are two mathematical gimmicks that make the whole thing mathematically plausible in the first place. So the mathematics has been rigged. The Eddington experiments was rush rubbish, <laughs> and the galactic lensing the lens is the wrong shape. The, there's more bending with gravity. There's more bending in the middle and less bending on the outside of the lens, which means it's exactly the opposite of a focusing lens. It can't possibly focus light, so it can't possibly work anyway. So it looks like David, you had a, David, you had a uh, flag up? Oh, yeah. Um, I had a question for Bill. Um, uh, you, you were mentioned, wh how f I know uh, Draft Science, I, I, I know him as well. Um, there's, he was doubting, of course, your the contention that you can't get out, get at information. And that's, I've, for me, that's not a, a, a unbelievable at all, given that most all news even today is controlled by six company. The question I have for you is, um, what? when was the last time you tried to get that information? And do you think that bringing that fact to the public that you can't get that information will help um, us with our cause by saying, hey, folks, they don't even let us see data, let alone have different ideas. That's my question. Um, it's been a while since I looked, looked at that uh, at the University of Maryland. And uh, it was only just about five or 10 years ago I did uh, the work with uh, Asi in Brazil. And uh, he is. Uh, I don't know if you know who he is, but he is the <laughs> very much so. He, he is the the promoter of Weber's electrodynamics. Well, I say we we try now because we have now the internet, so yeah. we can go look for these things instantaneously. And so all you need to do is provide me the name of the book. Now I have the search category library for the University of Washington at my fingerprint fingertips. I also have Amazon, who has 694 titles with Henri Poincaré, which they seem to have published. Like they, they just like publish all his old papers willy nilly and look, make them look, available. Look so I'm just curious. Do a Google on proofs of meta theory theorems. Proofs of meta theory. Okay, now that's what because I've already performed a search on Amazon for Henri Poincaré for meta theory in the title and I don't believe I find any so let me let me just share that uh, well, Bill, let's, what, let's, 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 let me just that. do the easier argument and just say now all of our personal experience I've never in my life experienced a library and especially the science library and yes my experience is pretty dated uh, who would even find it tolerable that they would tell them they couldn't provide a book that somebody requested a science book Listen, I've never that's, even, that's I've that never even heard of such kind of censorship. Science, that, that argument censorship, is not, I've no, never that even argument. heard of it existing. So why don't we get the testimony of these people that our government officials okay, we are got it. covering we got it. up facts? Why don't we get these librarians to testify in a court that they are censoring science? Because I don't think you could prove the case. Okay. Well, I mean, that's what's interesting about this, because if you could actually show that to be true, because, you know, I agree with you, that would be a remarkable thing that any librarian would agree to anything where they keep away some magical lock books. That would just seem to be against every I have a comment principle. on all of that, folks. If you go to the any job on the planet, and I'm not talking about librarian, any of them, any of them, physicists, uh, my job, I work in supercomputers. If my job depends on something my boss told me to do or not do, I will do it. Now, this isn't some grand conspiracy. It's, it's not even so that the person's thinking, well, you know, this is immoral. I'll lose my job. I'll go ahead and say that. So I think I How know. How many librarians have you known? Okay, because I have known uh, a couple of librarians. And I would speculate a, a, that, a, that a librarian at a scientific my point. library, a librarian at a scientific library, 
these are dedicated people. They love this subject <laughs> matter, and I don't buy it for a minute. That That's they would, okay. You they would remain that. silent if they were told to cover up the truth. There's not even librarians who are comfortable school librarians. Okay, when you go into a job as a librarian. Books. No, come on. I, oh, I guess well, you didn't hear. I guess theory. my Sorry. question it's to you is, wait, theory. wait. You have wait. no evidence. You're just making bold assertions with no evidence. No. Here's Hello. the question I have for you, sir. Did you listen to anything I said before you opened your mouth now? I listened to it, and I wouldn't agree with any of it. I, I quit. Are you saying that you don't agree with the idea that human beings, when it comes to their jobs, I'm sorry, are told to do or new or sorry. nothing? It doesn't work that way. Librarians yeah, are not Franklin, capitalists. Can you let, can you please They're not looking to make two hundred grand a year. Please. This is a preposterous exaggeration of a circumstance. We heard no you, sir. We heard you, sir. Weak sir. evidence. Bold assertion. Weak evidence. Franklin, I'll come in and I'll come in and take this over. Come on. We need you to do something on this. What we need well, to do is when people talk, when, here's, here's one of the rules you need, Franklin. When someone says something and they've already said it, we don't have to hear it a hundred more times, okay? The, we're trying to do an argument here. I've heard draft science, what, 12, 12, 20 times say he doesn't believe that a, a librarian. I made a point here. The problem is we can't get in the shouting match. You have to, to somewhat control this otherwise people are not going to you know show up here so i appreciate it franklin but you got to watch on those things yeah yeah franklin censor me put me in the back room so nobody can read me well i mean you know <laughs> I, it's not it's not I censoring it's called, I mean much it's called being it's it's a quorum i have a master's in linguistics there's a thing called a rules of discourse and rules of when you do arguments you there's no reason for you to complete what you, you do is you complete you repeat and you repeat and you repeat the same thing we have other people okay. here with other questions we heard you we believe we say you didn't believe it that's enough and well, the problem is if I ask you did you hear me you can say yes I did I still don't believe you that's the answer not not a shouting match I don't believe you. Yeah, it's I mean, not uh, evidence that every librarian is a willing to commit a perjury to their to their uh, petitioners that they're willing to cheat. They don't them. want to lose their jobs. I mean, that is an important point here. I mean, that is an extraordinary claim that Bill is making, well, which I say. too find it hard to believe that that there is even this place where they have the books that you cannot read. So that's why I'm trying to look to see what independent but, evidence I can find for that claim. But but uh, Franklin, here's I'll, I'll, here's another point, and this is a point that I want to bring up. I've been involved with with people like Bill, dissident thinkers, critical thinkers for over 30 years. There's one theme, one theme that keeps coming over, and it was in my movie as well. And that is, they say I asked these guys who've been working decades, all their lives, doing what has, trying to show that the system's rotten to the core, try to show new things. They all answered one thing at the top, which has exactly what Bill is saying. I said, why doesn't it change? The answer I got, because they have to put food on the table. I heard that over the last 30 years. This is the answer from people who spent their lives, like Bill, fighting this this idea that this uh, that's outrageous is not at all if you go to if you go to a, a a parking lot and beat the crap out of everybody and your boss is there and the boss says to everyone there not to say anything or you lose your job you think everybody will say no that's okay i'll lose my job the power of keeping your job 50 percent of all the high school students in my documentary film set off camera that they would forego truth in science to keep their positions. So this idea that a librarian, look, I've got a list of things that if I come up and ask for porn, uh, stuff like on, on um, child molestation, those are lists of things that they can't give. Maybe they can't give them either. You think the librarian's sitting there thinking, oh, this is physics. I love physics. I'm in Poincaré. Oh, his thing that should be, they don't know. It's on their list. They were told that. An assertion, let's just remember, it's an assertion being made that we don't have any witness testimony that it's true. That's all I'll say. But you, I know, but you said that. Well, the only, how how the many only times? Witness. I'm going to start marking the times how many times you said that. We've how many got times it. did you just repeat the same thing also? You just told us the same story in a longer version. No, I didn't. 
It's recorded. That was a news story. Come on. All right, go for it. Uh, anyways, Bill, I, I think I, Bill. I think we I think we need to do. I would say that uh, our organization as well needs to bring to light these kinds of things as well. Whether people believe it or not, that's okay. But I think, in my opinion, the CMPS should be actively involved in showing the public that these things happen because people even here don't believe it. So that's okay. I'm not arguing. Okay, I'm done with my question. Okay, well, my oh, little search question. here, I cannot find uh, any title from Henry Poncier about meta theory. So I have a question but, for Bill. Go ahead. Bill, are you familiar with the work that uh, Jefferson Lab has been doing here in Newport News? I sent out a, a message, and I think I included you on that, where they reported that they uh, did a bunch of tests. Are you familiar with the work that they're doing here where they supposedly tested the standard model and the weak force interaction? Um, I may have seen that, but uh, go ahead. Well, I'm wondering why you, well, the key point of this particular uh, newspaper article that got my attention was they spent a lot of money and did a lot of work, and their conclusion was that the standard model was okay and didn't and wasn't wrong. And um, that kind of surprised me that that was kind of their conclusion. We couldn't find anything wrong in the standard model. Um, did you look at that? I think I did, but um, you know, I have published many papers in this area. And uh, um, if you if you ask the question, you know, uh, like for instance, the standard model has problems predicting the mass of the electron. You would think it's one of the simplest things, and they they could do that. And uh, but they they have problems doing that, getting it accurately, and they have problems reproducing the properties of the physical properties of the electron, which we measure in accelerator experiments. Uh, the spin, the magnetic moment, um, and they have the, the mass. And uh, uh, and it's not just the electron, it's, there's many other uh, theories. So uh, uh, one, we have a, a, a general rule in physics that the simplest model that explains the most data is probably the best of those models. and. Uh, so when you have uh, an electrodynamic model of elementary particles, it turns out you can predict the complete set of elementary particles. You can predict particles that haven't been discovered yet. And you can say that certain particles don't exist. Now, in I, I, my field for my PhD was at the uh, uh, Space Radiation Effects Laboratory, which was an accelerator center. And I worked on pionic atoms, muonic atoms, and kaonic atoms. And uh, we produce all kinds of elementary particles. But we didn't consider an elementary particle existed if you couldn't make a beam of one. Right. Because let me ask you, let me ask you this theory question here. Predict, not the experiment. Um, is not this William and Mary laboratory that you are referring to somehow also Jefferson Laboratory? It may be. It was in Newport News, and um, uh, it's no longer associated with the College of William and Mary, but uh, uh, it was the world's most advanced accelerator for pionic, muonic, and kaonic particles uh, for 15 years. But I think after that, some other accelerator in the world uh, exceeded it. But uh, now, my understanding is, is that the Jefferson Laboratory, as they call it, um, somehow originated from William & Mary as a spinoff from William & Mary, and it's now funded by the Department of Energy. That's and, very possible. It, wasn't defund it was originally funded by uh, NASA. All right. Yes, right, exactly. Okay, now, so they do an experiment. There are supposed, and, and the local newspaper reports this, and uh, you got to realize a reporter doesn't know anything about physics, but they claim basically they couldn't find any anomalies in the standard model. Now, 
to me, as a headline to put in the newspaper, um, I sort of wonder why are they putting that out as their conclusion? They spent all this money and millions and millions of dollars. They upgraded the power of the accelerator. They did all these experiments. They claim they did these experiments for thousands and thousands of hours. And their conclusion was that the standard model was good. And it just struck me as why would they do that? Why would they do spend all this money only to conclude that they didn't really need to spend the money? Well, I think it's the same reason when they built the accelerator at CERN and they were looking for the Higgs boson and 15 of the 17 principal investigators said they didn't find it, the two, but two did claim they found it because they had spent so much money they couldn't get any more money if they didn't have some progress to show. And so they did make that well, claim. They, they, didn't really show any progress. they didn't show any progress. They just confirmed that the standard model was good. And, um, and my question is, why did the Department of Energy spend all this money only to confirm that the standard model was good. And so it seemed to me like it was a waste of the taxpayers' money. Well, it wasn't a waste if you were the experimenters getting those millions of dollars. This is the same uh, strategy that lawyers use, which is you don't make money by winning or closing cases. You win it, you make money by keeping and doing things. So it's just, it's getting funding, getting yourself uh, funded, writing papers, getting, uh, it's just a, a way to keep you employed, to keep your money coming, keep your, your, your uh, same, same models, uh, lawyers do the same thing. Yeah, well, well you're I mean, saying in a fact talk about thing. Conspiracy theories. Well, can I just inter interject a little bit? Um, you know about the, you know the government controlling and the government's evil and the government can't do anything right and they're you know all this stuff. But it, it you know clearly their students are educated in all these public and uh, private institutions and they're all teaching the same physics. So clearly it's by the vast majority of physicists are comfortable with the physics being taught. So the conspiracy goes a little further than just government. It is the entire institution of the science of physics is really the institution. It's not the government telling the scientists what to think. The scientists are telling the government what to think. I agree. Now, the, that leads to my point, which is, uh, I don't think this title, Truth in Science, is really a good title. Um, my my th thought is really is can can what we believe as true science be falsified? That's the question in my mind. I'm not really comfortable with the word falsify. I mean, shouldn't we use the word prove? It's like a court. You know, you're making arguments and you're trying to reason with a jury, us, you know, the people listening and you're presenting the evidence and showing how there's a preponderance of the evidence or there's beyond a reasonable doubt or whatever standard you're attempting to prove but it's really not about falsifying it's about proving and i would argue that certainly you can't falsify god theories you can't falsify things where you can't touch the thing that the person is claiming to exist there's no way to access the evidence but there's lots of pieces of this puzzle of quantum mechanics and relativity where there is a physical circumstance that we can test. So it's not all beyond testing and we should measure how strong that physical evidence is. And I would argue when we do that, you'll find big holes in their two slit theory and big holes in their photons are bent by gravity theory. Well, if so, why do they continue to believe it? Well, I'm not sure it's a continue to continue to believe it. I do agree. Uh, you know, I don't think you can prove anything and you can't say something is falsified either way. Uh, the way I look at it is more engineering. We sort of cobble together what we best can describe the universe as and, you know, keep trying to push that forward because it's always going to be wrong. It's always not. Uh, it's going to always be falsifiable. It's always going to be. So we have to sort well, of. Bill's data, Bill presented data further on there. Um, yes, you know, I know. Give me the experimental data, Bill. Okay, isn't that in a way you're saying that uh, I falsified the weak force? I mean, that was what your argument was. You, yes. You're claiming that you falsified the existence of the weak force. It doesn't exist. That's your claim, isn't it? And the strong interaction force also, mm -hmm. and, uh, and nuclei. 
But you're, you're claiming that you falsified the evidence for this uh, for these forces, which you say don't exist. And you're saying that you presented evidence that falsifies these forces, the existence of these forces. Isn't that what you're claiming? Right. And it's not my data that I took. It's NIST data. And NIST is supposed to be, you know, National Institute of Standards and Technology. It's supposed to be uh, a trustworthy uh, thing. And NIST uh, doesn't display the data on their website in such a way that it's easy to see this they know there's a problem and they have the true data i think on their website but you have to i had to copy 3508 digit pieces of data one at a time because of the way they put it on their website you can't get a table of it or something like that and uh so i had to copy that down and and do the analysis uh with uh, uh excel and doing least square fitting and stuff like that i had to do that myself and uh that took a lot of time just to do that but i'm not the first yeah, yeah. to do that yeah, yeah, yeah. The person before me who was at the uh, uh, uh fermi national accelerator center who did it before me before it was even finished before the eight digit uh measurements they'd only done part of them at the time he did it and he lost his job at the national accelerator center of course pointing that out and uh, yeah, well, seems that, you know, they're, they're not following this existential and postmodern scientific method then because you know we have this experimental data so they should have revisioned the hypothesis and the revision of that hypothesis should have just said that the strong force doesn't exist but they don't do that well, wait a minute, Franklin. There's nothing. There's. They're not looking. the The people who are doing this existential postmodern scientific method, they're not looking to falsify the data. They're only looking to see whether the prediction is correct or not. They're not questioning the predictions. They're not questioning the hypothesis. They're looking to make the prediction fit the data, and so. They're just modifying the parameters of the theory so the prediction fits the data better. Well, I mean, I think Bill is saying that even by mainstream analysis, you know, they they would have to agree with Bill that uh, the 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 strong force as a one over r to the fifth type force, there's no evidence of it, right? But that's just being ignored. Right, that's what Bill was saying. Is that well, I know, I know, but, but, but there's no, evidence and it's there's contradictory. No evidence. There's no evidence for it. it. Aren't you doing this? Aren't you kind of guilty of the same thing? There's lots of evidence for it. There's some some evidence in conflict. So isn't that what we're supposed to look for? Is the contradictions and the paradoxes created by a theory? And yes, and so, but they do have a right, you know, an opportunity to modify their theory when new data shows up, and that's not a crime. So. I mean, we're not really hearing their explanation for this data. And I would argue that clearly all of this stuff gets a little bit abstract because they don't have a really good model of the inside of an atom. So, you know, even making these measurements, you don't know what you're measuring. You're, are you measuring an electron that's moving half the speed of light? Or are you measuring an electron that's not moving half the speed of light? And it makes a difference. And that, that could be the whole explanation. Something simple could be the whole explanation. And we're not even we're not even open, in a sense, in this presentation form to the counter argument. It's like when people argue that light slows down when it goes through glass and they and then speeds up again. They'll say something like, well, what do the physics think uh, the light speeds up again? Well, the physicist would argue it never slowed down, really. It just took a longer path and therefore it took more time to get through the glass, you know, because it moved more distance. So there can be a perfectly simple explanation, but the the argument against will be this paraphrase that's never very honest and so i'm just i'm really paranoid about dishonest paraphrases because people have done it to me and i see people doing it to science they're putting words in science's mouth sometimes that just isn't fair i noticed that roger you had a flag did you have a comment i think he was because disconnecting came back hello there you are, Roger. There he is. Hello. We hear, we you. hear you. Hi. Hear me. 
Yeah, it's broken up a little bit, Roger. I know you're in the UK. I actually do a lot of stuff for the UK, so sometimes there's a bad connection. We're hearing you only intermittent, intermittently. Okay. Okay, there you are. Try it. Try it again. I just want to say that the uh, Manhattan Project uh, started censoring science texts. So it's part of that. I looked into the library. Are you saying yeah. that they're censoring uh, stuff afterwards from the Manhattan Project, or are you saying that um, that's, that's what, during? That's when they started censoring things. Oh. Because um, physics wasn't considered important. Well, what, what's that? Couldn't have been Roger too, because of the importance of the atomic bomb that they didn't want people to yeah, that's what know I'm about saying. that. The, because of the atom bomb, they decided physics was of military significant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they then started censoring physics books and physics uh, literature. I think that's so, a great point. And so when you start trying to pull up old science papers, you sometimes find that they've been redacted, they've been removed, mm -hmm. you can no longer access to them. No, that's actually a good explanation because that's what drives even the Higgs, the Large Hadron Collider. Why do you think all these politicians vote for putting that money to that? It's because they're looking for the next atomic bomb. They're looking for the power behind it. Um, I had another question for you uh, real quick. It's a simple question, uh, Bill. When was this uh, play, when you went to make a speech and you were sort of redacted from that um, uh, conference, when was that? It was the same year that uh, the uh, um, MPA met in uh, uh, this same general area of Baltimore. Uh, I spoke at both meetings. They were back to back. <laughs> uh, I have to look up the date. Is it 2000, 1990s? Oh, no, no, no. It was uh, uh, recently, like 2016 or. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's, I, before I even went to that conference, the person who invited me to be the speaker, who was the organizer, I said, do you know I'm a controversial speaker? He said, <laughs> oh, we're welcome you. No problem. Yeah, that and comes from there. And yeah. they had their equipment fail. And I provided the, the projection equipment and my notebook computer <laughs> to run that conference. And despite all of that, <laughs> that's how I wow. got <laughs> No, I understand. I had the same same thing happen to me in 2005 when I was filming for my documentary Einstein Wrong. I was in. It was the big fever of the 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 miracle year of Einstein, and I had uh, been setting up a interview with the Slack. Uh, the guy who was in my movie turned out to be in my movie. So I spent uh, probably about two months calling this person, setting it up, because they had all kinds of people coming over there because it was like all the fever pitch of Einstein. And so four, four or five days before I was supposed to actually go there and film inside the Stanford Literary Accelerator, a guy calls me up, and he I think he was from Australia. He, wasn't, he was UK or Australia, but I think it was an Australian accent. And he was nervous. All of a sudden, instead of talking to me, he was their PR guy. All of a sudden, when he called me up, instead of that fun and loving and, hey, let's get going, someone, someone he had listed us, and someone looked this up. And he literally, in a shaking voice, said, um, uh, it's been decided that um, our community here at Stanford Linear Accelerator feels it's best you not come and film inside. And so this was in 2005. So yeah, I mean, it, I'm really surprised, Bill, that's 2016. But um, the question I have t is, is again, the same question. I'm sorry to bring it up, but we and the N MPA um, or CMPS, and formerly MPA, should we be bringing this to the public attention? Because right now, this kind of thing has happened politically, of course, and we know that, and uh, eco ec the ecology of the planet, all that. So these are things that we can put up there and, and say. I've been using the, uh, in my channel, YouTube channel, is I've got a sign, a non-critical thinker's website. It's a sign of a, of, of a lady, 
um, I think it was at Stanford University who turned to the camera and there was all these graduate students and held up a sign of protest. And I put on there, um, we can't uh, challenge relativity at our universities. Is, is this, this kind of thing uh, and the stories, especially you have, Bill, I think are things that we can put up just to, to bring this idea down that uh, everybody thinks that science has done well and they do the experiments and, and they, in, in, uh, uh, hairy questions and what, why don't they uh, look at what they do? Well, there's a lot of uh, uh, intentions behind it. I agree with draft science that, yeah, a lot of that is just put foot on the, foot on the table. I'm just doing because I learned that. I'm not going to rock the boat. But I think this is something that we in our organization need to start taking these stories and putting to the front and, and telling these things because people don't know them. Well, respectfully, I disagree, David, but um, I'd like to know how a theory of science can be falsified. I think that's what you should be thinking and asking. This, um, I agree with the fellow who, I, I don't think these uh, um, little stories are really, they're just going to get you labeled as pseudoscience and, and you know, I mean, I don't really see it going anywhere. I think you need to really have a theory or some kind of expression of what is it? What does it mean to say a, a scientific theory is wrong or it's falsified? I don't really see that they permit falsification. And what you have are these little stories about, yes, we, we have these stories that science is suppressing dissident opinion. But in effect, basically, they really don't allow falsification. That's really the bottom line. Uh, I agree with you, but the only thing I would say, uh, I agree, Harry, I, that's, that's in a perfect world. But when I go and I talk to a lot of people, my, I'm sort of more on the forefront to try to bring more people into the critical thinking uh, arena. That's one of the first things they say, I, even at a party with a friend. They don't say, do you falsify or, you know, we can show something wrong. I say that, but they go, well, of course you can. And if, they, if you do, the university and the professors know that. They do the experiments. They'll look at it, see that Einstein's stuff is wrong, and then they'll find out what's right. That is the obstacle that I see. And that's, I, I agree with you. That's a stupid thing. But human beings are emotional. I mean, that's that's where I'm. I see it. So before I even... I talk about the falsification right away, and then what I ha what I hear from my science friends, my computer supercomputer friends, who are pretty bright people, that's that's the first thing they said. Well, of course, if they find these things, why don't they do something about it? And what well, and that's what I, I'm. Could, could I just make a suggestion that you know <clears throat> we have a common interest as much as we all have our own thing and we're all quite unhappy with each other's theories. Um, that we have a common interest in knocking down the the king and uh, i think it can be done through questions that we can frame well constructed logical questions that point out the paradoxes i i could make my, my question would be how can a lens that shaped the wrong way exactly the opposite way focus light i mean i could ask a simple question we could put some of these questions together that we could all agree on are questions that need an answer and then maybe as a collective, or we had a couple of hundred people that signed on, we did a Patreon or something, we could even pay them, okay, to answer our questions. And that we could get some real talking head, like a Michi Ayakaku or, or Degrassi Tyson, to actually respond to the points we make. But I think we have to make those points collectively, and we have to be clean of any kind of pseudoscience. I think this is something we all have to be paranoid about is putting on that tinfoil hat and just being an outsider pointing at the inside and saying, you're bad. We have to do more than that. Well, one of the, respo one of the responses we have to that, and I agree with that completely. I, I, uh, in fact, I have, we have a website that, because I'm only one person, it's called criticalthinkers.info. On there, the, the idea was to do exactly that, was to identify very clearly, very concisely problems with, uh, that we see, okay, with mainstream, whatever you want to call it, so that a person would go there and they would see, oh, uh, tell me, what do you mean something's wrong or whatever, and have those things uh, by our, our uh, organization agree that these are problems, these are clearly statable and that they will be there for someone to see. So yeah, we, I do, we do have a, a mechanism for that. It's just that 
getting everybody together and doing that. We're hoping to do that on Saturday of our conference coming up the end of this month, which by the way, we're gonna be giving uh, Bill a lifetime award, which is uh, absolutely um, merited. The other thing I would say about your comment to draft science is I've been trying to do a little differently and I support everybody's theories, even if they conflict with each other. One of the reasons I do that is because I say, we ourselves have to be open to the, the same thing that every other, other profession opens themselves up to, and that is multiple ideas, multiple models, multiple languages, multiple computer languages, multiple apps, multiple computer systems. We seem to have a problem with that in physics, and I think as long as we start continue to fight amongst ourselves instead of uh, sort of saying, okay, we can have five different theories of the, and models of the universe, which we can, and, and recognize that and support each other. That kind of, how can we, we tell the mainstream that they're wrong or that there are these problems if we can't even amongst ourselves say, yes, theories, multiple and different theories can exist together yeah. and some are better than others. Yeah, my response to that would be that just as I'm an evolutionary and I think uh, religion is nonsense and they're all nonsense and I don't want 10,000 religions. I think there's one truth and therefore I want to find the one truth and I want to support the one truth and I really don't want to do this, oh, Protestant, Methodist, uh, Episcopalian, they're all the truth. They're all just as good. No, that's, that's admitting defeat. I don't think we're defeated in having the best answer to, to sit on the throne. I want the best answer to sit on the throne and I want everything else to have to knock it off with hard evidence. I just don't buy into this argument that any chatter is good chatter. To me, it sounds like pseudoscience noise, most of it. Most of it is not founded on evidence. It's founded on somebody's passion. They love Tesla or they love this or they love Poincaré and anything they said was was golden and they're the pope and that's it. they're just going to put that cross on the door and that's they're owned by jesus and that's it and they, they're not they're not pervious to logic and they don't care about the truth regardless of what you might think of me that's what i care about is logical arguments and i want the truth in the end i want the truth i don't want my truth i want the truth i i agree right. that that's, so a, that's we're, getting, a, we're getting towards the uh getting towards the end of the uh our time what here is, tell us what truth is you you're gonna you're gonna impose it on everybody so you gotta be able to define it what the is the sun it? is hot okay the, the water's wet there are things we can say are true i'm just saying i want a truth that's simple that's accurate that's all i just want the. You, you think there's more than one truth right you think the sun is hot and cold at the same time i don't think that's possible i think there's a truth in description i want a true description of the mechanics of the universe so, and that's Bill's title here, which is Truth in Science. So we are getting towards the, the end of here. So let, let me see if I can do a little summary here. So, but uh, like I said, hit, hit the title of the presentation, thank you, Bill, for bringing this presentation. And, uh, you know, Bill just brought this to me today. And that was great because uh, I was kind of wondering what I was going to talk about. But so it was uh, terrific. And anyone is welcome to do that um, uh, during any of these science chats. But uh, Bill was talking about truth in science, and it looks like you know we started out on the philosophy, the axiomatic Newton's method, and, and the current method of postmodern scientific method, which which I think is not so bad, but it, except to just keep ignoring this part about um, you know when you run into experimental data inconsistent with your hypothesis, you should revise your hypothesis or throw it out. And I don't know, I just don't just don't think we're doing that pretty much. Um, so that's the philosophy part. And um, then, you know, I think Bill did bring up this thing about, you know, what are the forces here? So he mentions these forces and, you know, a lot of uh, what he went to were, which was to show that, you know, two of these things actually don't exist. The weak force doesn't exist and the strong force doesn't exist, which he showed through um, various data charts. I'm still not quite sure, you know, how this shows you know, one over R squared, but I'm sure there, there's some there's some logic behind that. <laughs> Since uh, one over R squared uh, graph looks like that, it's an exponential decay. So, uh, uh, so it's probably related to parabola, but I'm not exactly sure how that's related to parabola. 
But, um, you know, Draft Science brought up a couple good points about, you know, where does this data come from? How do they get it? Does it really mean anything? Um, and we can always ask those questions, although probably this is just like measuring atomic weights. So I'm pretty sure we know how to do that. So it's probably okay. And so Bill also provided some other evidence that the, the neutrons binding energy can't actually be found in the, in the atom. So there's lots of reasons to believe that, um, that neutrons don't exist, and uh, which is one of his main points here. And we developed, we have lots of theories about all these things here. And uh, he discussed uh, point of care as a uh, meta theory. And uh, Bill did make the extraordinary claim that there are certain books um, that are banned from being viewed, uh, which is kind of hard to believe. I, and I guess uh, the only expert testimony we have on that would be what Bill says. <laughs> so although you find that incredibly hard to believe. But Bill also says a lot of, a lot of very extraordinary things if you, if you uh, read the kind of things he, he, uh, he presents. And so that would be another extraordinary thing. And uh, in our little search of the internet here, I couldn't find Pony Care's um, book that contained the word meta theory in it. So maybe it is being banned because I can't seem to find it. I can't find it in University of Washington's library i can't find it in uh, amazon um but it was mentioned that you know ponicare's conclusion was that you know perhaps all these things are based on a one fundamental thing i think you know draft science seems to think that the gravity is the more fundamental thing uh, bill might think that electrodynamics is the more fundamental thing um, i personally think coulomb's force is the fundamental force that would be my opinion um, but you know, where did that everyone's uh, open to their opinions. But I, I think we would all agree that that all these forces kind of act the same, like they all have the same speed of light. That because they there there is a fundamental one of those things is fundamental, right? And all the others are aspects of whatever we feel that fundamental is. So uh, and then we yeah. See so what else did we discuss? And we got into a lot of discussions about these stories about, about dissident scientists being suppressed or being fired or being, you know, not being very welcomed. Um, or it can just be like me and no one just, no one pays attention to anything you do. So I'm perfectly harmless, right? And uh, whether, but we did have this final question about, you know, what are, what are we seeking? Is it okay to have uh, six different versions of the universe, or should we really be seeking uh, the truth, which there probably is only one truth. So the, the sooner you guys all believe in my theory, the better we'll be. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I, those... could, could, Franklin, could I make just, I wanted to, I came here to just give me like two minutes to talk about the upcoming conference. Is that po okay. possible? Well, 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 we'll wrap it up with that. So go ahead and uh, Tell us yeah, about the latest news in the conference. What what I'd like to invite everybody to is, if you're not going per, you know, uh, there in person, we will have a setup. I do have my multi-cam set uh, setup. We're going to be having. We're going to literally have four or five cameras, uh, and we will be broadcasting live. You just would go to live.naturalphilosophy.org, and you will see us live. Uh, we invite everybody who can't make it to participate, and those, of course, being live, will be uh, uh, going uh, directly to the YouTube, so you can watch them there. So we're not going to have that problem. Um, and so I invite everybody to do that. Uh, it is free this year. We ask if you can give a donation. That's great. If not, of course, it's it's available for you uh, for free. And then, of course, I wanted to make a mention that we do. Uh, every year give out a Lifetime Achievement Award, and that, of course, is going to uh, Bill Lucas, Dr. Bill uh, Lucas, who's I, – I am an absolute fan of his work, and uh, it's incredible. Uh, again, I think we're in a stage where we, we are in between paradigms. So the idea that we're going to have one right now, I think, is a little hard to say until we get, of course, a paradigm shift, which will happen when we look at all of these different theories. But regardless, his um, uh, work is very much 
in the least uh, to give a, a lifetime achievement award. One of the things that's sad and nice about our organization is that we can do that to people who we feel have contributed a great amount to the field and unfortunately are not recognized by the mainstream as doing so. So uh, I want to congratulate Dr. Lucas and, on, on that award and he will be uh, presenting at our conference. So if you have enjoyed this, you can watch him uh, live. I think he's going to be presenting at least two times there. So hope you go there, uh, naturalphilosophy.org, uh, and we welcome everybody. Thank you so much. Let's see. Did I get the uh, URL? It's going to be live at naturalphilosophy.org. Is that yes. where that? Yes, and that will okay. get you. It'll take you to the live streaming page of our website, and that live streaming uh, uh, is YouTube in this case, and we have the uh, Sling Studio system, which allows us to do really great professional uh, live to uh, streaming. So you're gonna, we're going to have angles all the time, switching live. Um, and uh, that was thanks to our donations. We have donations to our, 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 our CMPS by two donors. Instead of bringing someone to the event from a long way like we did last year from uh, Dr. James Maxlow, we de I decided to get the equipment needed so that we can then from now on and in the future do the broadcast to around the world. So um, I think that's going to be a really big boon. And there's other things going to be happening at the, at the conference as well that we're going to have actually trials, put things on trial. We actually have costume and all that stuff for you. Uh, who's working that out is Bill Nappy. He's from MIT. And uh, so that's going to be really great. And we're going to actually have a Grand Prix of theories. Those who want only one truth, we're going to have a Grand Prix. And who wins that Grand Prix at our trial? Um, at our trial, at our uh, conference, we'll take home a, a, a great and gaudy uh, present of you know the best theory that uh, that Monaco's racetrack can uh, muster up. So, thank and you. And what uh, what are the hours for when we're going to be doing the talks? Is that going to start like uh, 9 a.m.? Yeah, it's going to start around 9 9ish, 9 9:30, 9 and they will go through the day until uh, around 5 or 6 o'clock. And then in the evening, we'll have some evening uh, sessions. I think one of them is the trial. So I believe on Tuesday, third, I think on Thursday night, we'll be uh, um, uh, live, brought, live streaming the trial where we're literally going to have uh, Newton, Einstein, and uh, a real live judge, an ex Supreme Court justice. We all know who that is, who's an etherist. Uh, so it's going to be quite a lot of fun. It's going to be uh, moderated, and, I mean, uh, put on with uh, Bruce Nappy, like I said, who's great at communication works at MIT. So that will happen in the evenings. And also on Friday evening, we'll be having uh, our banquet. And then that's when we'll also have a talk by Dr. Lucas. He'll be receiving his Lifetime Achievement Award. And then on Sunday, on Saturday, I'm sorry, we will start probably a little later, 9.30 or 10, and go till 5. And that's going to be more of an open forum. We're going to be talking about uh, the marketing aspect as much as we want to talk about the uh, way we do all these things. Uh, draft Science, I met him through YouTube. Uh, I congratulate him on his work. He's been out there for many years. Uh, I've just started my YouTube channel. He was kind enough to have me on his channel one, a couple times. But we need to realize that like even Picasso, one of the greatest painters, I love him as an artist, spent a lot of uh, probably 20% of his time marketing his ideas. And that's one of the things we have to realize we, can, we want. But as, as you know, uh, people won't listen unless we take some time. So I'm looking to Saturday to have that open. We will have chat. YouTube has chat. So you'll be able to put in your um, uh, comments there. And we will have somebody, uh, maybe I'll even put um, uh, Franklin in charge of that, where he can watch it live as it's being broadcast and take care <coughs> of it. So we invite all of you here. We also hope to uh, uh, come up with ideas of how to make more people uh, aware of this uh, forum. Uh, I think it's great. So uh, I want to thank you, Franklin, for every, you know almost every week being here. I know it's not easy because I did that for a long time. I thank everybody else who participates here, everybody uh, here today. It's greatly appreciated. It's not un uh, going unnoticed. I do have a weekly or semi-weekly newscast of Dissident News on the YouTube channel. And I always mention this uh, uh, to everybody. So thank you so much, everybody. And hope to see you either in person or virtually at our conference uh, coming up at the end of this month. Thanks, Franklin.
Okay, well, that will wrap it up for our current episode of the Science Chat. And let's see here. Today is the ninth. We'll probably do this again maybe next week. And then uh, I have another another science camp on the 23rd, so we won't be doing that. And then hopefully we'll be live on the 30th. So we'll see how that one, goes. One of the things is, Franklin, just while everybody's here, um, and maybe we would have somebody willing here to uh, do it on the Saturdays or not. Is that something we should try to arrange? Uh, if someone wants to. Yeah, but uh, it has to be the same software, right? So you have to be able to. No, no, no. This software, we purchase the software rights in the, in the sense of to use it. I know Bill has another uh, alternative to this, but we do have this. And so if you uh, are, all you need to have is the um, uh, admin rights. And this is uh, downloadable on any, um, any Mac, PC, tablets. Uh, Androids, everything. It's cross-platform. So if somebody wants to do this, they can do it from anywhere in the world and have control on any type of computer system. They can even do it on their phone if they wanted to. All right. Well, I'm going to stop the recording.